anybody that uh, doesn't know me, I'm Laura Hansen. I'm working with the neuro-ophthalmologist. So I'm going to talk about a 69-year-old guy that I saw in clinic a couple of months ago now. Um, he presented with vision changes that have been going on for one month in the right eye. His description was a light show and cloudiness um, that seemed to be present constantly but wasn't bad enough that he was paying attention to it all the time. And over the past week or two, he'd noticed some missing areas of vision and he really liked to play golf and he was having a harder time finding the ball after he would hit it. He didn't have any pain um, and had no headache and no symptoms at all of jaw claudication. He had had a couple of episodes of what probably would be described as a transient visual obscuration in that eye, um, but no other symptoms of elevated intracranial pressure. He did snore, but had recently been evaluated with a sleep study and did not have sleep apnea. So this is his past medical history. He did have significant coronary artery disease and had an urgent three-vessel cabbage about 10 years ago and then had a few precancerous lesions removed from his skin. He was married. He's the retired director of engineering for a hospital. He would have a couple of beers per week, but no recreational drug use. Those are his medications there. At the bottom, he was on prednisone, 60 milligrams daily when I saw him, and I'll kind of talk a little bit more about that. So he had been seen by a regular eye doctor about two weeks prior to presentation. His family doctor had ordered an ESR and CRP for the vision changes. The ESR was 45, and the CRP was 6.2. Um, he had an MRI of the brain done with contrast. In the interest of time, I'm not going to post it, but just you'll just have to believe me that it was normal. Uh, he was started on steroids, the prednisone 60 milligrams, and scheduled for a temporal artery biopsy and then sent to neuro-ophthalmology. So his acuity was 20-20 in both eyes. I could not find an afferent pupillary defect, but his pupils were minimally reactive, so do with that what you will. Uh, his motility was full, and he was orthophoric. Color vision was full, or excuse me, um, confrontational fields were full. Color vision was slightly decreased in the right eye. Pressures were normal. So his slit lamp and dilated fundus examination were unremarkable other than what I called stage one to two optic disc edema in the right eye. There were no disc hemorrhages. These are disc photographs of the right and left eye. So you can kind of appreciate it's relatively mild disc edema there. Um, the disc is a little bit hyperemic. These are his visual fields. This is a fluorescein angiogram. Again, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of the images because I don't have enough time, but this is at 22 seconds. Um, he did have normal arm to retina time, normal AV transit. I picked this image because I thought it kind of nicely showed some delayed filling of the optic nerve head there. That's at 32 seconds. There's a little bit more filling. That's after a couple of minutes. So it was really all I found on the fluorescein. So I would just ask everybody to think for a second about what your differential would be for someone with disc edema who still has very preserved visual function. And I put up a list here. Uh, so these are the things that we typically think about. Um, at the top, I put diabetic papillitis because it's probably the most common. Um, hypertension can do the same thing. Papilledema. Uh, we'll usually, patients will usually have preserved function, but I would expect it to be in both eyes, although it's pretty mild, so it could be early. Uh, so much the rest of the list there. But what about the high ESR and CRP? So I used a trick that I learned during residency. If, you're, if you don't really know what's going on, then you ask the patient, how's the rest of you? You like to have to do the hand motion. And I think it is a good trick, and it does work. So then he told me, well, you know, actually, back in May, I did have this weird rash, and there were these small, flat, red spots, and then there were some itchy pimples. So he saw a dermatology. They did a biopsy, and it came back porokeratosis, which is a benign lesion. It's kind of like a hyperkeratotic thing, um, and so the dermatologist's assessment was that she had just kind of inadvertently biopsied this lesion within the rest of the rash, and it wasn't really giving an answer, but she thought it was um, pityriasis. So she did do some lab workup, 
Um, his creatinine was elevated and apparently has been that way for years. Um, and he's, he didn't really know why and wasn't really aware of it. Um, his ESR back then was 73 and 23.3. And then she also did an RPR, which was not reactive. And then he said, also, I had this lesion on my tongue back in January. Um, and the gum next to the lesion receded significantly, but his dentist didn't really know what it was, and then it went away. He didn't have any genital ulcers. He was having night sweats, and then he related that he actually did have an unprotected sexual encounter with another male um, in December. So this was the workup that I decided to do, um, and I thought we would repeat the sleep study and do a lumbar puncture if none of these provided an answer. And he was scheduled for the TA biopsy, so I thought, okay, go ahead and do it. But then this is how his labs came back. So the rest of the labs were fine. Um, his RPR was reactive with a high titer. His FTA uh, absorption test was reactive. His quantifier and gold was also positive, and he, it does look like he probably has diabetes. Um, he did have a chest x-ray that was negative. So I canceled the TA biopsy, and I had him do a lumbar puncture, and he had slightly elevated white blood cells. His protein was okay. The glucose was actually maybe a little bit low. The CSF VDRL was negative, and cytology was negative. So I had ID see him, and they started him on two weeks of continuous penicillin, 24 million units a day for syphilis. Um, I thought that he would need to stop the steroids immediately, but they actually continued him on the steroids for the first three days because they were worried about a Jarish Herxheimer reaction. And they felt like the quantiferon gold was probably a false positive, and I guess they're going to uh, retest it in a month or two here. So I'm not going to talk a lot about ocular and neurosyphilis. I'll just talk a little bit about it. But I, what I really wanted to focus on was more of the details about laboratory testing, because I think we don't really review that very often. And in this case, it was kind of a critical piece of the puzzle. So uh, syphilis is caused by the spirochete treponema pallidum. Ocular syphilis, in particular, is considered a secondary syphilis and also a neurosyphilis. Um, so apart from what you do for the eye itself, you do treat it the same as neurosyphilis. Um, the manifestations, as everybody knows, are many and varied. Um, specifically with the optic nerve, you can have inflammatory edema, neuroretinitis, atrophy, or um, an optic nerve gamma, so an actual lesion on the nerve head. Neurosyphilis can occur during any stage of syphilis, not just tertiary, and it's kind of divided into early and late neurosyphilis. So early neurosyphilis is when the involvement happens within months to a few years after the primary infection. Late neurosyphilis happens years to decades later. And they tend to have different manifestations. So in early neurosyphilis, they usually affects the meninges and the blood vessels. And you often get cranial nerve abnormalities, especially with 2, 7, and 8. Uh, you can get arteritis of the vessels of the brain and spinal cord, so they can end up with big strokes. Late neurosyphilis is kind of the typical one that we think of. That is part of tertiary syphilis, and that's the syphilitic dementia, the tabes dorsalis, and often it'll mimic uh, psychiatric issues. So the diagnosis of <clears throat> neurosyphilis is diagnosed is based on your clinical judgment, the CSF findings, and the serologic testing that you do. The typical CSF finding would be that you have elevated white blood cells, usually with a lymphocytic predominance. Usually it's 10 or more. Um, they may have increased protein. And the serologic testing that you do may or may not be positive. So it's a really nonspecific test. This is a graph that I took from the Utah Health Department. So there's been. Uh, increasing rates of syphilis in the U.S. since 2000. So the top line is the U.S., the bottom line is Utah. So although the rates are less here, it is still going up. And this shows the disparity of infection rates between males and females in Utah. Um, so that's just kind of something to keep in mind when you're seeing patients. You cannot culture treponema in vivo, and so you have to use either the, one of the direct diagnostic methods or the indirect diagnostic methods. 
The, di the direct methods require a tissue sample, either fluid or scraping from a lesion. You can do dark field microscopy, you can do histologic analysis or PCR testing, but they have to have a lesion, first of all, usually it also has to be moist. And so for most people, it's not diagnosed that way. Most people use the indirect diagnostic methods where you test for antibodies. The non-treponemal tests, the RPR, VDRL, and then a couple of others that are used less common, they measure the level of antiphospholipid antibodies. So those are formed when the host cells are damaged by the syphilis. The syphilis. Um, and sometimes it'll respond to the lipid on the surface of the treponeme, but it's pretty nonspecific. The treponemal tests are the FTA, ABS, the um, fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption test, the TPPA, which is the treponema pallidum particle agglutination, and then the others I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Uh, but those measure antibodies that are reacting to an antigen from the treponeme itself. So you use the non-treponemal tests like RPR and VDRL for screening, monitoring how well they're responding to treatment, and detecting a reinfection. The VDRL is the only one that you can use to test the CSF because of its sensitivity and specificity profile, and even then the sensitivity is only 30 to 70 percent. So the primary limitations are that the sensitivity and specificity goes down by quite a bit in primary and late syphilis. Uh, you can also get a fair number of false positives. You know, you can imagine it's pretty, there's a lot of things that could give you that kind of reaction. And you can get false negatives from something called a prozone reaction. So that is something that happens when the antibody titer in the plasma is really high. So the way that they do, like the RPR, they have a little card and they mix your serum or plasma with um, like these antigens that are kind of bound with these little charcoal particles. And it forms this antibody antigen lattice and then it kind of precipitates out and they see a color. But if you have really high antibody titers, then it kind of messes with the balance there and it looks like it's negative. This is, a, I thought, a nice chart showing how the sensitivity changes in the different stages. So you can see that the VDRL and RPR dropped significantly in primary and late. I put a list up of some and not even all of the things that can give you a false positive in, with the non-treponemal tests. So the treponemal tests, like the FTA, ABS, they will remain reactive for years or maybe a lifetime, whether or not you have treatment, and so they correlate poorly with disease activity. So right now they're primarily used as confirmatory tests unless it's somebody, for instance, who has a negative RPR but you're suspicious for syphilis. Um, they tend to be more expensive than the screening tests. The TPPA, um, the predecessor for that is the microhemagglutination assay, the MHATP, which isn't really used anymore. They took, in the MHATP, they have the antigen bound to erythrocytes. Um, in the TPPA, they've changed it to gelatin particles so that there's kind of less um, abnormal reactions with the plasma to the erythrocytes. So this is the list of the ones that are out there right now. The newer ones are the enzyme immunoassays, the TREPCHEC and TREPSURE, and the chemiluminescence immunoassays. Um, the advantage of those is that they're fully automated, so in higher volume situations, they offer higher throughput and less cost. And because they're fully automated, there is no manual pipetting by a technician, so it kind of decreases the um, occupational hazard for them. Uh, but they do have, they have a higher sensitivity, but a lower specificity than the FTA um, and TPPA. So this is from that same paper, um, and kind of gives a nice way to interpret the test results when you do a non-treponemal and a treponemal test. Um, the treponemal tests don't have any way to differentiate between syphilis and then the non-sexually transmitted or endemic types of um, spirochete or treponemal infections, the yaws or pinta. Um, if you have a positive RPR and a negative FTA, then that was a false positive RPR. 
if the RPR is negative and the FTA is positive, then it's either primary or latent syphilis, or they've already been treated, or uh, you had a prozone reaction for that RPR. Uh, and if they're both negative, then it's either no syphilis or really early syphilis, and you'd have to recheck. So I think my suspicion is that my patient had a prozone reaction with his RPR. Um, it, that most commonly happens during the secondary stage of syphilis, and most labs don't routinely test for that phenomenon. So if you're suspicious for it, you can ask them to dilute the sample down and retest, and then it would come or should come back positive. Um, but you know, I don't think anyone was aware of that. So. There is a new paradigm of diagnostic testing that the CDC is endorsing, and they're calling it reverse sequence testing. So you use either the EIA or CIA test as the screening test, and if that comes back positive, you reflex to the RPR to confirm active infection. So it's designed to catch more of those early, late, or latent syphilis cases. Um, and if there are any discordant results, like if your EIA is positive but the RPR is negative, then you do the confirmatory testing with the TPPA. Um, it has higher specificity than an FTA ABS, so it must be that one. Um, but so that they're kind of advocating that people change how they test for syphilis. Okay, that's all. Any questions? <coughs> Sorry, I did, I did test him for that, it was negative. That's actually a really good point. You should test for HIV in anybody that you're suspicious about syphilis. And then is the main reason for not testing both RPR and EIA at the same time, just simply a matter of not over-testing? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Do we have EIA here? I don't know. That'd be good. 